Hi, I'm Richard Sedlock. Welcome to the Green Ninja course on climate science. Episode 3 is a brief introduction to climate and climate change. Surely the planet's climate has changed naturally over Earth's history, so why all the recent hullabaloo about climate change? We'll talk a lot more about this later in this series. This episode is just an appetizer. What is climate? The meanings of climate and weather are related, but they differ in a fundamental way. What is that difference? It comes down to a four-letter word. Think about it. You've probably figured it out. It's time. Weather applies to time periods of hours to a week or a few weeks. Climate applies to time periods of several months to several decades. A useful definition of climate is the typical temperature, precipitation, humidity, prevailing winds, etc. in a given region over a long period of time. Put another way, climate's the long-term weather pattern of a region. The study of weather and the study of climate require different scientific approaches and expertise. Weather is the focus of meteorology. Climate is the focus of climatology. Because such different scientific training is needed for each, you should be very careful about climate pronouncements from the local weather forecaster. One of science's biggest challenges is to understand Earth's climate so well that we can explain past climate changes and predict future ones. This is very difficult for a number of reasons. To start, Earth's climate system is extraordinarily complex. It consists of many components or subsystems, each of which is a complex system in itself. The atmosphere, the oceans, glaciers, the biosphere, and many others. A change that affects one of these components doesn't produce easily predictable changes in the other components. We formally call this the, a, a nonlinear behavior. The climate system is intimately linked to the carbon cycle, which has been and continues to be heavily modified by humans via the burning of fossil fuels like coal and oil. So the climate system is even more of a moving target in terms of our understanding it. So much is going on in the climate system that it's hard to know when the climate is stable or at a steady state. And in fact, even the steady state has so much variability that it's hard to distinguish it from real lasting change in climate. Well, despite these challenges and many others, climatologists have made great progress in understanding Earth's climate system and, and the rate of their progress has increased greatly in the last few decades. One of the insights that all climatologists agree with is that global climate is changing and it's changing more rapidly than at any time in long geologic history, tens of thousands of years, even hundreds of thousands of years. A separate question is the degree to which the causes of that change are natural versus human caused. By the way, you may encounter the phrase anthropogenic global warming or AGW. I don't like that label because global warming isn't the only change that's underway. There are also changes in precipitation patterns, for example. Well, another way to phrase this issue is to ask, what is the natural variability of climate? We know that climate changes naturally. Geologists have long recognized certain landscape features as products of moving glaciers, even where no glaciers are, are present at the time, at the current time. So they use these sorts of features to deduce the locations of glaciers and the time of ice ages in the past. I talk more about this in a later episode, but for now we'll jump to their conclusion. This image shows the extent of ice in white in North America and the Arctic region at four times, ranging from 21,000 years ago, abbreviated 21KA, to the present. The most recent ice age was at its height at 21,000 years ago, and the ice gradually melted until about 8,000 years ago. So not only do we know that climate does change naturally, we can address how long changes take. In this case, over 10,000 years to move from an ice age to a warm period. 10,000 years ago, humans were so few in number that their activities had a negligible impact on the climate or other aspects of the Earth system. Well, that's changed, 
particularly in the last couple of centuries. This pair of maps shows the distribution of cropland and pasture in 1750 and in 1990. Cropland means land used for agricultural crops. Pasture means land used for grazing livestock. Look at their incredible expansion on every continent. The growing human population required food, so we changed the surface of the earth drastically. And don't forget that some other kind of vegetation occupied those areas before they were cropland or pasture. Vegetation that supported complex ecosystems. And here's North America. The top diagram shows the natural distribution of various forests and other ecosystems in 1700 before Europeans had transformed the continent. By 1990, cropland and grazing pasture have overtaken much of the continent, like a cancer, displacing natural forests, grasslands, and other ecosystems. Two other changes in the natural world that have occurred in the last 50 to 100 years during humanity's exponential growth in population and overall planetary footprint. Average world temperature has risen about 1 degree Celsius or 2 degrees Fahrenheit since about 1900. Sea level has risen about 200 millimeters or about 8 inches since the late 1800s and the rate of rising sea level is increasing. You can see that the curve is steeper in the late 1900s than it was at earlier times. Another change involves Arctic sea ice. Coverage of this has broken through into the mainstream news media recently. The pink line in the top globe, or both of them for that matter, shows the minimum extent, the minimum extent of the ice at the end of the summer. That's usually early to mid-September. Averaged over the period 1979 to 2000. The actual ice in that top globe is the minimum extent in um, 1979. The bottom globe is the minimum extent in 2011. Yikes! If you go to the URL that's shown on the slide there, um, you can see an animation of the changes from 1979 through 2011. But that animation only covers the last 30 years or so. Perhaps recent changes are just random fluctuations that will average out over time. In a report published in November of 2011, a group of scientists published the results of careful testing of proxies of Arctic sea ice that go back 1,450 years. Proxies are stand-ins for the thing you're interested in. For example, the width of tree rings is a proxy for climate conditions while the tree was alive. Wetter and warmer conditions produce more growth and thicker tree rings. Sea ice proxies are different, but work in roughly the same way. Well, the key graph from this new study is shown here. The light red band indicates the range of uncertainty in their calculations. You can see that sea ice extent varied over the years, but always within a band of the values range from 9 to 11 million square kilometers until the last 10 or 20 years. Recent changes in the extent of Arctic sea ice are not a typical natural, natural fluctuation. Some of the most striking recent changes in the Earth system are in the concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. As we'll discuss in Episode 8, greenhouse gases trap part of Earth's infrared radiation and thereby maintain Earth's surface at a higher temperature than we predict based on our distance from the Sun. Carbon dioxide, or CO2, is a particularly effective greenhouse gas. It's a key part of the carbon cycle and is released into the atmosphere when biological matter is burned. And note that this includes very old biological matter the fossil fuels, coal, and oil. Scientists are able to very precisely measure CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere, and they have continuous records at many places around the planet. The oldest continuous record is from an observatory on top of Mauna Loa, a 14,000-foot-high volcano in Hawaii. The regular small squiggles in the blue and red line are due to seasonal variations involving plant growth. 
the average concentration shown by the black line has risen steadily from 315 in 1958 to 394 in 2012. That's measured in parts per million or PPM. So in 54 years, the concentration has risen by 25%. But maybe that dramatic increase isn't particularly special. Maybe it's just a temporary change, part of some long-term natural variation. After all, it only covers 54 years. What do we find when we look back farther in time? Well, we don't have direct measurements of atmospheric CO2 from before 1958, but fortunately we're able to deduce past CO2 levels in other ways. For example, cores drilled from the ice sheets of Greenland give us information going back tens or hundreds of thousands of years. In episode 19, we'll investigate how this works. But for now, it's enough to know that there's no scientific disagreement about whether the cores really record information from so long ago. Well, here's the CO2 record of Earth as deduced from several well-studied ice cores from 20,000 years ago on the left to the present on the right. From 20,000 years ago until just recently, CO2 concentrations rose fairly gently from about 190 parts per million to about 280. Then starting about 150 years ago, the concentration began to rise far more rapidly. That rate of change certainly is different than compared to the preceding 20,000 years. But maybe the current value of 392 parts per million isn't so different from other times, even farther in the past. Maybe we aren't looking back far enough. 20,000 years maybe isn't far enough. Well, first, let's check out a couple of other important greenhouse gases. Nitrous oxide, or N2O, is used in fertilizers, aerosols, engines, and anesthetics. It occurs naturally, and humans figured out how to artificially synthesize it in 1775. As you can see, the concentration of N2O in the atmosphere started to climb very, very rapidly in the recent past. This looks a lot like the CO2 graph. Methane, or CH4, occurs naturally as part of natural gas, the fossil fuel. It also results from, quote, fermentation of organic matter, end quote, within, literally within, wetlands, rice fields, landfills, and livestock. Yes, belches and farts of cows, pigs, sheep, and other livestock produce about 20% of global methane emissions. And whoa, in the last 150 years, the concentration of methane in the atmosphere has climbed at least as rapidly and as much as the concentration of CO2 and nitrous oxide. So the cause of these rapid rises since about 1850, the evidence overwhelmingly points at humans. First, consider the growth of the human population. The graph at the lower right human population on the globe is scaled so that its time axis is exactly the same as those of the other three graphs here. The exponential growth of human population coincides exactly with the timing of increase of greenhouse gas emissions. And that shouldn't be a surprise. I mean, all those extra humans didn't just sit around singing Kumbaya all day. They made fertilizer, raised livestock, planted rice fields to feed the growing population filled landfills with their accumulating waste, burned fossil fuels like coal and then oil in increasing amounts, and developed technology like aerosols, engines, and anesthetics. But just to put what should be an unnecessary final nail in the coffin of the humans can't be the cause denial, let's see what we can learn from ice cores that go back much farther in time than just 20,000 years. This graph shows the concentrations of atmospheric methane and CO2 over the last 800,000 years. So the bottom curve in red shows methane and the top curve in blue is CO2. 